it rears up out of the sea, towering a thousand feet and more above the water. A coastline of solid granite, crowned with fog. The south coast of Newfoundland, sheer cliffs punctuated by deep fjords that wander many miles inland. It's a place of forbidding beauty. Round counter west, one of the few places on this coast where the cliffs yielded enough land to build on. People came here to fish, but like so many other communities on this shore, Round counter is only a memory now, abandoned and silent. Yet people still come here to fish in the deep, quiet waters of Round Counter Bay. They come in small boats, barely 30 feet long. They call them longliners, but they're hardly more than trap boats, decked out with a small house as a shelter from the damp chill of a south coast winter. These inlets run deep over a hundred fathoms in some places. It's good fishing ground, and these boats come here in all seasons. It's a strange south coast contradiction. The shoal grounds are 15 miles and more out to sea. The deeper water is here in the quiet fjords. On a brooding February day such as this, most boats choose the protection of the coastal cliffs. Not that these fishermen shun bad weather. When many of them started out, they worked in open dories in all kinds of weather. His small longliner might be modest, but Clyde Durnford will tell you it's a big improvement over the early days. You started off fishing in dories, did you? Right. How long ago was that? Oh, 25 years ago. When did everybody change over? Oh, about 16, 17 years ago. I uh, got those small boats. You find much of a difference now fishing uh, out of a boat like this? Oh, a lot of difference. You got no water bottle with you. Stop the windows, stop the doors, or let her come then. Are there any dory fishermen left? Oh, yes, a few. And what we call those are motorboats, eh? Not the gasoline dories, like we just had, but the motorboats. You got now with it, put motors on mostly. You miss the days in the dory? The open dory? Ah, uh, well, in one sense, but it was hard work. Now there's no hard work here. All to do is to work here. Only all you got to do is bake your trail and do your feet. That's there's no hard work here. I suppose now, this time of year, too, in the dead of winter, it was pretty uncomfortable in the door. Oh, I guess it was. When that frost was on during January, well, these small boats were pretty uncomfortable. Well, like we fell if we could lay in the floor. Something out there. What's a good day's fishing for you fellas, huh? Oh, you could get 15, 1,600 pounds, 14, 1,500, 1,000 pounds a good day's work. You know, if you were getting it four or five times a week. But you get 14, 1,500, well, you wouldn't make a good week's pay. you got a pretty long season here, don't you? You fish most of the year. Yeah, right. We start now, I don't know what time we start. It's your 20th January, of course. We'll be at it the 20th December if we can sell our fish. What's, a good, what's the best time of year for you fellas now? What? Oh, uh, mostly February, March, April. It's free this month. Last year, now, May and June were two good months. But way back, it was, it was pretty poor, though. May and June, I was pretty poor, two months. We started going to show water, eh? But last year, we were fishing in show water early. Well, then we got them, eh? When the last of the trawl lines are hauled, the last of the fish gaffed aboard, the boats prepare to head for home. But home for these fishermen is a long way from Roncounter Bay. Though they've been fishing just a gunshot from the wharves, stages, and houses of Roncounter, Clyde and the other fishermen head back out the bay. They steam west hugging the cliffs, 
for more than eight miles. Then they head up another fjord, steeper and narrower than most. Just when it seems impossible there could be a settlement in this great corridor of stone, there it is, barely visible in the distance at the head of the bay, a cluster of houses dwarfed by the surrounding hills. Of all the places to settle, in this cavernous bay, carved by a glacier a million years ago, the only land to build on was the boulders and rubble the glacier left behind. Yet here it sits, the town of Francois. With the enormous cliffs looming up on all sides, the houses of Francois could be a child's building blocks scattered around the harbor. Yet Francois clings to its place here with a strength that matches its awesome surroundings. Close to 250 people make their homes in Francois, preferring to concentrate on the sea rather than the granite fortress at their back. In this wild, inhospitable place, where the land is rugged and unyielding, the sea must become the sole provider. For Francois, the fishery is survival. For such a small place, Francois has quite a few boats about a dozen longliners, each with a crew of two, and a handful of smaller one-man boats. Most days, if the weather's been half suitable, you'll find them lining up at the government wharf, unloading their catch. It could be 3,000 pounds. It might be a few hundred. It really doesn't matter. What does matter is that by going out every day, fishing long hours on the trawl, they keep themselves and their community going. It was this spirit, this determination, that allowed Francois to weather the tide of resettlement that swept away so many other places on this coast. Uncle Bob Skinner was one of those who resisted resettlement. A fisherman for more than 50 years, Uncle Bob still spends a few hours each day in the stage, baiting gear, and as he puts it, keeping in shape. Well, I went fishing when I was nine years old as a boy with my father, but... Uh... That was only just, you know, summertime. And we was fish off around Dunbite, off around Mecklen. Down around St. Pierre way? Yeah, St. Pierre, Mecklen. I wasn't only 16, my brother was 14. I suppose those were... We both uh, went together, eh? I said those were sailboats then, were they? Oh, sailboats, yeah. We had engineers, sometimes he'd go and sometimes he wouldn't. Couldn't rely on them? Couldn't rely on them. Didn't know much about them, didn't see. A lot of fish on the go then? Oh, yes, there was a lot of fish summertime off there, but we had to split them and saw them. On, board, had, on but, board the boat? Oh, yes, after two weeks sometimes. Go off for two weeks, and then we come in and take out that. Take that out for the wash out. Well, it was the first week, we fit the wash out, and the others we packed back in the, in the boat, in the uh, stage. You're not from uh, Francois, are you? No, from Rich's Harbor. Where's that? The wife is from Francois. Where's Rich's Harbor? About 13 miles below this. Not there, not there anymore, though. No? Goodbye, Daniel. What happened? They resettled? Resettlement took the works. Parsons Arbor, Brown County West, Coldesock East, Richards Arbor, Muddy O, and uh, Mosquito. That's just Claire McCallum. But that was all, there were people lived there, you know. Nobody there now. But resettlement, uh... Took them out. Yeah. Why, uh, why do you think that they never uh, resettled Francois? I don't know. The, they liked the place too good, I suppose. It was a really good place for you know, make a living, and they had to go anywhere else. I suppose they had to do that same job. Uh -huh. Looks like Francois is going to stay like, like it is? I, I just see one. 
I dare say you'll be like you. If the fishing, if the fishery don't uh, go down, and then I suppose you'll have our goings and John live on God. <laughs> Not everyone in Francois works on the fishing boats. There's another tradition here, born of the same isolation and dependence on the sea. The lighthouse on Francois Point, a mile and a quarter from the community. One of the few manned lighthouses left in Newfoundland. This light and a couple of others on this coast are run by eight lightkeepers from Francois. Roland Durnford is one of those lightkeepers. He works the light on Penguin Island, a remote spot 15 miles out to sea. Roland and another keeper spend 32 days at a time on that lonely cluster of rocks. Penguin Islands is also a good fishing spot for Francois fishermen, and Roland sometimes finds himself doubling as a weatherman. Now I know that uh, a lot of the fishermen in, in Francois, they, uh, they rely on you guys for, uh, for the weather report sometimes. Uh, not really rely on us. But they do call us uh, in the mornings when, uh, when they come out, uh, four, three, four o'clock in the morning, come out just before the weather forecast comes out. You can't get no forecast in the morning before uh, 4.30. And that's one of the disadvantages of, uh, of the forecast. So when they call you, what do they ask you? Ask us, um, uh, they ask how much wind we got, which way the wind is. If you, if you know if there's any any sea in the water, you're kind of almost kind of scared to tell when the weather is uh, the jackass you know, it's just a jackass day. You, you you're afraid they're going to come, afraid they're going the wind is going to raise up and they're going they're going to get caught out or something, and probably that's going to be your fault. Uh, you don't want to take that that chance, but uh, generally everything turns out to be pretty near what you tell them. But how was it as a job? I think people got an idea. Lighthouse keeping is a pretty, pretty lonely occupation. It's a lonely occupation, though. But uh, still, it's a good job. I wouldn't. Uh, I don't think I would trade my job now, right now, for for anything. And you're saying you kind of you feel lucky that you have a job, I suppose. Well, right now you're lucky to have a job, especially with not too much education. Because uh, people with college degrees can't get a job, so. When you only got grade eight, nine, perhaps ten, and some less than that, you can get a job making eleven, making eleven wages. That you're lucky. So I count myself lucky. A lightkeeper's job requires a certain philosophy, an acceptance of isolation. Maybe that's why Roland Durnford is able to take the difficulties of living in a remote place like Francois, and put them into perspective. I think people look at it, uh, where would you go to better yourself? The way everything is going this day and age, that, to my opinion, I don't know where you would go. We get to our problems, but it all works out, and they get those problems everywhere. Is it hard to get around uh, in the wintertime? The main road, what we call the main road, is it's pretty good, but you must always take the side roads. The one that winds sort of between the houses. Sort of a mixture of rock and boards and everything, aren't they? Yeah, well, that's about the size of it. You're living in a in a valley. You got the drainage from the hill, and you got to have uh, bridges to go across the brooks. Some people say you want one leg longer than the other, but uh, our legs is very well even. You don't need a car. Our boat serves our cars. If it wasn't uh, everybody else got their cars, but we'll stick to our we'll stick to our boats. Beautiful scenery here, though. To the visitors, it's a beautiful country. To us, it's just, we just call them, we just say, oh, the eels, or the eels to climb. But to every, all the tourists that come here, it's, uh, they tell us it's beautiful scenery and talk about how, how nice it is around here, but I guess you've got to be from somewhere else to appreciate what we got. Baiting time in the community stage. 
While some Francois fishermen prefer the peace and quiet of their own stages, many more like to come here in the late afternoon to get ready for tomorrow's fishing. They cut frozen mackerel, bait their gear. They talk about fish, the tide, the weather, about who did well and who didn't. Even those whose fishing days are over like to lend a hand, maybe reliving some of their experiences on the fishing ground. It's tedious work. 500 hooks to bait in every tub, each crew with six or more tubs. The jokes, the conversation, make the work and the time pass quickly. It's also a chance for future fishermen to get in some basic training. In a couple of hours, the trawl is ready, and the stage is closed up until early tomorrow morning. Five thirty in the morning, eight miles east of Francois, in a place called Devil's Bay, the trawl goes out. We're aboard another of the Francois longliners, the River Queen, owned by Morgan Durnford. As dawn slowly creeps into the sky, the day promises to be a poor one. Fog, a cold, steady rain, and a freshening breeze. Looks like it was wise to stay close to shore rather than risk the outside grounds. As the daylight grows, the trawl is all out, and we wait an hour or so before taking back. Do you usually pick up much fish here inside? Oh, yeah. You know, get a day's work, eh? You know, you get, uh, we had 900 trade days in a row. Or last week, where we, stood, where we got our gear to today. That's how I was going to get 1900 a day, but <laughs> you might get a day's work out just saying. Everybody here fishes trawl, eh? Right, everybody fishes trawl all year round. No gillnets at all. Why is that on there? Because there's gillnets further down the shore, isn't it? Oh, yeah, there's gillnets down there, but well, there's better fish, and well, that's all everybody was used to, I guess, is trawl, you know. So everybody's pretty good at it, so that's all they use. It's the trawl. Oh, yes. How are you making out for uh, bait with that mackerel? Is it any good? Oh, yeah, the mackerel's all right. There's, uh, might miss as good as a squid, but uh, well, there's no squid to get, so we've got to use mackerel, you know. But there's this pretty good bait. Well, we had it all last year, and everybody done pretty good on it, so uh, there's no complaint there, I don't think. Okay, well, better go out now and check and see what fish you got. Yeah, okay, then. Why don't two people use gillnets around here? Well, there's, you can't get a uh, top quality fish out of a gallon. I don't care who says you can, but you can't. There's no way. Fish is drowning in a niche now that they'll turn black and everything. If you don't know it for two or three days, you know it's itself is not, uh, it's not good fish. I didn't, I didn't get on this spoils of ground for, for using trial on it afterwards. I suppose there's a uh, fish getting in the niche, and, and uh, sometimes you're nice bit before you get your niche all or something other, and, uh, I put a fish rotten in that and lying on the bottom, I put a poach of ground over with dirt. Well, I wouldn't know where you would get a better fish than a trough fish, no in his mouth. I wouldn't know where you could get a better fish than his life at most of them when you take them more boats. So it must be the top quality fish, if there's any such thing as top quality. What's the run of fish like out uh, on the ground? Well, on trawl you get some big fish, and well you get some small fish. But uh, well, the again, it's that seem like you're catching all the big fish because well, you got me pretty well large going fish, say uh, 20 inches or 24 or 5 inches, more you're missing again. It. So I mean you're catching all the, you know, all the breeders with that. So you figure trawling is definitely better method. Oh, guarantees and guarantees. Anyway, I, I think anybody didn't agree with that, but uh, well, I, w I wouldn't say that they'd agree with anything. Do you normally get a mixed size, big fish and small fish? Well, around your own trawl, you do all year round. You put down all in one tub and get two or three, two or four hundred pounds, probably biggest kind of fish, and you could all next tub and you might get you might get after much, but it could be as small as rats. How big do they have to be to keep? You know, how small are the ones you throw away? Sixteen inches. Under sixteen inches is no good. She fits them back. That's right. Any small to man long liners, how many uh, how much gear do you use? Well I use uh, some people use eight line tubs and some more use nine line tubs to average from six to nine tubs. 
So what would you say now is a good catch for one tub of gear? Well, if you get 300 pounds on a tub of gear, that you you know you're doing good, eh? you just pretty good going. That's if you could average that. Eh? But some dubs now you might get five or six hundred pounds on a dub, and then probably next one you won't get hundred pounds. Eh? But if you could average say about you know 300 pounds on a tub, it's pretty good going. The fishing has always been good in Francois, but for the last couple of years, selling the fish has been a problem. Fishermen here traditionally sold to Ramia, 26 miles to the west. But that market was lost when Ramia closed down in the summer of 1982. For five months, no one in Francois fished. When they went back to their boats, they steamed six hours back and forth to McCallum, where a collector boat took their fish to Galtus. When Ramia reopened last year, the new owners didn't want fish from Francois anymore. Finally, last November, Dr. Chess Blackwood came on the scene. He owns a plant in Clarenville. And he offered to buy fish in Francois for 22 and a half cents a pound. The fishermen agreed. So now, when they come in each day, they load their fish into gray insulated containers and ice it down. The fish then waits on the wharf until the coastal boat arrives to take it on the first leg of its journey to Clarenville. How do the fishermen here feel now because they have to sell the fish all the way to Clarenville when there's plants up and down the south coast, you know, just a few hours steam from here? How do the fishermen feel? Well, the only way you can feel about that, if they don't give a damn about you, you don't give a damn about they. And if just Blackwood keeps taking the fish, it's just well sell to you, it's just sell to there's no difference. Do you feel, or the fishermen here feel, that they've been kind of neglected because you're so out of the way down here? Yeah, they have been neglected, but what can we do about it? We've been talking to the politicians about it and everything, but they is about saying about that as they is about everything else. All they'll do is listen and throw it in a waste basket or pass it on through. I mean, there's no good talk to them anyway. They're not listening. I mean, do you find it hard to make a go of it down here with all these problems selling fish, or are the fishermen just as content to keep on going and, 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 uh, and do the best they can? Well, there's, there's not a problem to make a living here, but everybody here makes a good living. There's all young fishermen and everybody's interested in it, but, well, you got to have problems because fishing is like any other job. If you're not on it, that you're not doing good. But, well, I suppose you got to put up with that, too. I notice that a lot of the fishermen here are, are young men like yourself. Uh, they obviously must think there's a future in the fishery and in, in Francois. That's true. The, I, I really think they do myself, and, well, like you said, is most all young fishermen here, but it uh, seemed like to I that the young fishermen was here are just saying it's all for us. Without a doubt. You never given the thought yourself to uh, giving it up and maybe trying someplace else or something <laughs> else? No, I wouldn't know what else I was going to do, to tell you the honest truth. I, I think I'd make a poor taxi driver. The CN Coastal Boat Hopedale at the wharf in Francois. It's taking on 33 gray containers. Containers that dropped off here three days ago. Now they're full, over 43,000 pounds of fish caught off Francois, headed for Clarenville. Ahead lies a 14-hour boat ride of 140 miles, and then a truck ride of another 60 miles. It's absurd, with so many plants so near. The fishermen of Francois are the first to admit it. But that's not their concern. What matters to them is they have a market. They are selling their fish, and for a good price. That means the Francois fishery can continue. And as long as the fishery survives, so will Francois.